Thanks for joining the Reinvention After 50 podcast. Rob, you interviewed somebody today, David Shalek, who is author of Mediterranean Summer, a really interesting book about David's journeys. Um, but tell us about how he reinvented himself. He literally had to reinvent himself in 2008. Tell us about that. Yeah, so in 2008, you'll hear his story. He's basically had a degree in uh, light and set design, but then decided to go into culinary arts, worked in New York, came to San Francisco, then took an unpaid internship in Provence, France, stayed there, France and Italy for five years, came back to San Francisco, and then 2008 had the big financial crisis. And he did something that most people don't do that or didn't do at that time was get a branding coach where the branding coach helped him decide what he wanted to do, put all his experience together to form his two or three other businesses that he started. So he was a, he was a light designer and, but, but had a desire to get to, to go full board with the culinary did the, so what was the, the, the branding coach kind of help brand and guide him towards. Yeah. Because he was using that light and set design work to, work on cooking shows. So he produced about 250 cooking shows. So the great thing about this, which I love, is the fact that he utilized his past experiences and combined them. It's just like you and I with Brand 50. Like my past experience is more on the production side. I segue to the business side, but now I'm combining both. And, and you know, you're, you're doing that as well. So we all do that. We all have past experiences and why just shelve it, right? Why, why exactly. not take advantage well, of what can benefit you? That's, that's what David said is that he had to decide, okay, should I just completely scratch my, you know, my cooking experience and try something completely different? And he said, no, that, that's, that's silly. I have, I'm good in both of these areas of my life. Let's find a way to combine them and make it work. And that's what he did. That's great. You know, and so much of our interviews are about people that have the ex experiences. You get to be over 50. You have a life's journey, life's worth of experiences. I look forward to listening to David. Let's take a listen. Welcome everyone to Reinvention After 50, a Brand 50 podcast, and I'm one of your hosts, Robert Erie Artboard, and today we are going to be talking about one of my favorite subjects, food, but not just any food, good food, Mediterranean food, food that makes you live. And today we have Chef David Shalek, who's the owner of Volo Chef, Mediterranean Summer. He's from New York, and he came out to San Francisco to work at one of the prominent restaurants here. And then he took a chance and he went to Provence, France. And from there, he thought he was only going to be there for six or eight months, landed, and he landed in Italy for five years, came back to San Francisco. And then in 2008, when we had the huge financial crisis, he did something very interesting. He got a branding coach, and we're going to talk about that. And then, of course, we just got through the COVID times. We're still kind of getting through it. And he had to kind of not really reinvent himself again, but had make adjustments again. So David Shalek, thank you very much for joining us today. No, thank you. I'm honored to be here. So I want to start from the very beginning. When we talked last week, just trying to get to know each other, your actual, so when you were born in New York and your actual degree was in lighting and set design. That's right. While you were going to school for that, you were a cook at restaurants. That's right. But then you also like that. So you, you kind of did a juggling act of pros and cons of which career to take. Why don't you walk us through that? Well, yeah, that took a little while to get to that point. You know, when you're a student, you have summers and a couple nights a week to make some cash. And I was doing both. I was working in the restaurants and going to school to be a designer. And when I left university, um, I jumped right back into a restaurant because that was a job waiting. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I started to get the itch. You know, maybe I should look into what I went to college for. So uh, the, sh the short of the long is I ended up as an associate at a big lighting and set design company in New York City. And uh, they were the big time. You know, there was a lot of cool stuff going on. And I got in as a draftsman and worked my way in. So that was pretty cool. And I was still working in the restaurant at part time. I went from full time to part time. And that was great. I was busy, young, having fun, Manhattan in the 80s. You know, it was all good. Uh, but at some point, you know, I started to think maybe I should focus on one or the other because I'm doing a lot laterally, but I'm really not going to move ahead, you know, if I keep dividing myself like this. Mm -hmm. So I did the old fashioned pluses and minuses of both show business, food business and festered on that for a while and let the list grow and kind of looked at a, the pros and cons of everything and finally decided, you know, this food business thing is looking like it's grabbing me. I'm feeling a little more heart for it. 
And at the same time, the California cuisine explosion hit New York. And that kind of woke me up a little bit to maybe I should come out West and check it all out and start fresh. So there wasn't just the choice, but there was also a geographic move to really kind of restart, you know, and check it all out. And that's how that began. So when you made that decision in New York, how long did you work in the culinary arts restaurants in New York before you came to San Francisco? Oh, gosh, at that point, you know, maybe six, seven, you know, high school into college. So six, seven, eight years, maybe. OK, you know, so and I was in, the, in the city for a couple of years after college. Uh, and I'll tell you, the lighting company was amazing. I mean, we were working on some really big, big time projects. You know, it was fascinating. Yeah. Like on any day of the week on my drawing board, there could be a national convention or a major music tour or a Broadway show tour or one of the daytime television shows or newsrooms or anything. I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff going on. But, you know, my social life and the friends and just what I was after, I think the food business was kind of luring me in. And, and that's, that's how that happened. <laughs> Yeah, if if it was me, I probably would have picked the latter. I would I would have I would have picked the lighting set design career because, <laughs> of course, that's what I'm into. Yeah, well, but, yeah, of course. And you know, when you're in New York City, I mean, you know, and you're yeah. delivering plans to the light plot to the Radio City through the stage door. I mean, that's pretty cool for a young guy, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So then, so then you come out to San Francisco and you work at Campton Place Hotel, correct? Right. When I first came out here, yeah, okay. to San Francisco. Yep, and that was yeah. one of the pioneers of the American food revolution, Bradley Ogden. I met him through the chef I worked for, uh, Larry Forgione. They were friends. So that was kind of the referral uh, mm -hmm. when I got out here. So here's where you're interesting. Well, your journey is already interesting at this point. But so you work at Campton Place, what, for maybe two, three years? Couple years, almost two years. Yeah. And you were, you were about to get promoted to become right. a sous chef, which is a big step. You know, it's, it's yeah, a big step, time. Yeah, step yeah. Close to, closer to being an actual chef, right? You're getting there. And then you had, I remember when I was reading the book, Mediterranean Summer, it was a lady, a famous lady chef that recommended you possibly going to Provence, France to learn from not an actual chef, but what you call a, a home cook, Provence. Well, she, I, I was, that's how it was happening was that when I was working at the restaurant, you know, I started to feel more like a robot cook than someone who really knows how to cook, you know, and I felt that there was something missing, you know, to go to work every day. It's cool. You're getting paid. Everything's prepped for you. You are just kind of banging it out every night on the line, you know, working hard, having fun and all that stuff. But I just didn't feel like I was getting into the, you know, the essence of where those menu planning comes from or where you get your ideas. And I was reading at the time a gourmet magazine, a lot of articles about Europe and the world and there was a story about a woman who had a, a little sort of program in Provence where she'd bring guests, not food business, just, you know, anybody and, mm -hmm. and stay at her farmhouse and do the Provencal lifestyle thing and go to the markets and visit some winemakers or other artisans and come back and spend time in the kitchen and go through sort of that lifestyle. And that's where Alice Waters of Chez Panisse, you know, got her whole inspiration from originally was this very pure and simple way to do things. Mm -hmm. And um, the article was about this woman, but said she's great friends with Alice Waters at Chez Panisse. And in the winter, in the off season, she's usually in Berkeley hanging out over there. So I was like, that's pretty cool. I knew Alice just from the events that we were doing around the Bay Area. So I called Chez Panisse and Alice picked up. She happened to be there that day. She picked up the phone. Oh, David, nice to hear from you. We're chatting. I said, I'm just curious, is, is your friend Natalie in, in Berkeley this year? She goes, yeah, she's standing right next to me. Hold on. <laughs> the phone to her. And so what was the big part of this decision was this was a non-paid internship. So you That's right, from, board. from almost being promoted to a sous chef. Right. For the raise. Huh? You're going to get a raise. The raise, of course. But here's what I want listeners to take out of this. You had this gut feeling, right? And I think... Right. When we get this gut feeling to do something, I think most of us, we stop ourselves because of fears, like the fear of the unknown. Like you had no idea what was going to happen. Like, how am I going to no, make I couldn't food? speak a word of French in a small right. town with 800 people in the middle of I don't know where, you know. But, but you did it, right? And, yeah. that, and that's where the real journey starts. So tell us what happened when you got to Provence, because reading the book, you thought you're only going to be there for six or eight months. And you thought you're going to just have this great moment with what was her name? Uh, Natalie. 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 Yeah. Natalie. Yeah. But she kind of 
she made you rethink how you thought about being a chef, correct? She kind of well, in, indirectly, indirectly, she, she wasn't grabbing me by the hand by any means, right? There was something lacking that she picked up on that she was tough on. And I had to say, wait, you know, give myself, I need, I had to go for a little walk. I, I don't want to, the story's in the books. So I can't give it away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, something happened. I, I had a, I had a personal wall, let's say, uh -huh. that she saw in me. And I went out and did a little soul searching. I was, went up to the top of the village and looked at the valley, you know, we're in the, in the Vaucluse Valley, you know, the hilltop villages. And I just said to myself, you know, something needs a fix. And I'm already hooked into this Provençal lifestyle and these markets are amazing. And this, there's so much to learn. There's so much here, but there's something else that I've got to figure out. And I still wasn't quite sure what that was yet, but I knew there was something. And then, you know, the angel side, the allure of being in Europe and kind of free at that point, you know, I mean, just saying, look, I really don't. I don't want to go home a failure to myself or say I messed that up or be angry about putting it on somebody else. It's just, I need to figure this one out. You know, one thing led to another. And I started working on a boat the first summer. Um, and then when you're cruising around the Mediterranean, you start seeing, seeing the world. And then it's like, okay, I think I need to, you know, do some investigating. So is it safe to say that moment in time where you had to figure stuff out, that's almost a blessing in disguise, right? Well, you decide, am I going to get on my own horse again or am I going to be victimized myself, you know, right. and, and, and go it, back uh, knowing I, you know, maybe came up short. No, it's their fault. And I'm going to go home and whatever and go back to pick up where I left off. No, that wasn't it for me because I knew in my soul, you know, the cooking thing as a medium is something that still needed to be figured out. And all this other was things, these external things were coming around. They're actually part of it. Right in one way or another, when you're expressing yourself somehow through a medium, right? So I just was like, okay, we're gonna wipe the slate clean here and, and go and, and figure this out. And I got myself uh, into Italy and was very fortunate to meet a food writer who helped set up internships for me and I could just carry on. And for me, if that's at the forefront and I'm living out of bags and I can still be happy just walking in a village or getting a cappuccino in the morning, I, I was less concerned about material needs, mm -hmm. way less concerned, you know? And uh, that's what carried me through. I mean, I thought I was going to be abroad for six months and I stayed there for almost six years. And once again, if you didn't make that decision that everyone, you know, in the book, a lot of your friends or people you work with, so you got to be crazy living. Yeah, be crazy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but now who's crazy now? Right. Yeah, I'm already crazy. I'm in the food business. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We got a show business. <laughs> but, uh, okay. So she was tough on you. And then, Boy, I mean, Natalie and stuff, yeah. Now and, and then, then the chefs start getting tough, you know. Yeah, one way or another. And then I'll tell you, it's already tough living in a country where you don't speak the language and you're not making any money and you're clandestine and yeah, trying to figure stuff out and you, a lot of white noise, you know, and you don't know, and it's a different culture and the whole thing, you know, a lot of risk. <laughs> yeah. So before you worked on this the boat, this private yacht, did you work in right. restaurants before and high-end food stores, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, a lot, a lot of nice restaurants. Beautiful. So you did that before the boat, or did you kind of do it like? No, kind of at the same time. I mean, you know, the the restaurant internships give you room and board. So you know, the yacht world outside of Antibes is a big business, and they hire every season. You know, so you can get a job on a yacht. You know, if you're good, and uh, and you can do it. You know, and that pays enough to get. My needs were simple, so I could make enough in the summer to cover the rest of the year. Now let's talk about the yacht because there's a the owner of that yacht uh, was a couple. The lady was another lady who pushed you. Another hard. one, right? And let's she actually. Can you say oh, if it wasn't for her that you? Well, I won't say if it wasn't for her, but she really pushed you to really think like a chef. You know, the galley and the boat wasn't like a real kit. I mean, of course it was a kitchen, but not a kitchen that you would expect. You just had to figure things out on the fly. Well, if I take the sound bites from the folks, the women who uh, threw me in the sand and pull from that, one of the chefs in Italy, you know, I mean, she literally took me outside of the restaurant and gave me a drubbing because of a, dis a wrong decision in her mind that I made that day. And one of the my main take from that that she said to me was, you know, I don't want to follow her in my house. I want to lead her. Mm -hmm. and that's stuck. 
So I knew that that was another step I needed to kind of figure out is what is this leader thing? You know, in my what's the the presence or the figura, as the Italians like to say, as the chef? You know, what is my job? And I know I need to cook and write a menu and all that. But what's my role? You know, and the missus on the yacht. Now, mind you, this is the big yacht that I worked on. Yeah, yeah, she wanted to, she thought she's just going to hire, you know, she's going to hire a cook and make what they like and all that. But she saw something else that she knew I had in me that I was lacking. And she said, oh, I think I got to help fix this. So that was sort of the, va the, the, the value add to my job. I didn't know that was going on, you know, until the very end of my tenure with them. But she saw this and said, oh, I've got, this guy's got something I need to help him out. But not like, hey, let me take you for a walk and explain it. <laughs> you know, you're going to. Exactly. It's, it's, all, it's always these indirect things that make you, you know, like you said, search your own soul on, on how to do these things. Right. Right. And even the nature of their lifestyle. I mean, the challenges that are thrown at me, not just the weather and the sea and the being a half deckhand and the work and the this and that. This just the dinner parties and the this and the expectation of the level of quality has to be. I mean, do I have this? Am I going to rise up to this? And you know, make them happy and confident. And then you think you're good. And then bam, comes another one. <laughs> I do want to talk about this one, talking about all these things you had to do. The one section, you don't have to get that detail with it, but man, the, the Monte Carlo one, when oh my gosh, all these boats were put together and you had to cook for a hundred, like hundred people in, in a school, closet, in a closet, <laughs> right? Boy, talking about being creative. When I was reading that section, I felt like I was uh, watching an action movie, right? You know, all the people that were helping you, the guys, you know, they're coming down with empty plates and they want more. And, you know, oh my God, I was mad. It was mad, mad. But, you know, the thing is, OK, like an action movie, but getting to the action, it's like Das Boot. If you've seen Das Boot, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's all that confinement and that dark and hot and all this. Right. Yeah. And the external stuff, because there you are in Monaco, right, for the Grand Prix and the, the racing and the models and the people watching and the this and then the parties. And I'm just, a, you know, incarcerated in the gallery yeah. for a week. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was crazy. That was brutal. Yeah. But and, yeah, that so was, let me put that into context. Okay. Yeah. So everybody can see like, Oh yeah. Oh. That's the, Oh my gosh. Let me take a look at that. Isn't that amazing? I thought it was bigger. <laughs> well, this is 135 feet. Is so it? that's not bad. That's a good size. Wow. But, you know, I mean, you can. I can't imagine there's a kitchen in there. Yeah, a tiny galley. Wow. Very tiny. Well, put it this way. I mean, in the day, I mean, this yacht was built in 1930 mm -hmm. in America. So you think about the priority of food in America in 1930 for a yacht owner, you know, whereas if the Italians had their way, I'm sure half the below would be a galley. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. That's good. You know? So what else can you tell us about that experience on the yacht? Like, what did you really learn? You know, well, I mean, I'm the boss of one and, uh, you know, I don't have a dining room other than one table for eight, really, and a crew to feed. And so there's, you know, keeping morale. And it didn't matter if I have 50 tables or one table. You know, there's an expectation that there's a chef on board, not a cook. And hmm. that's there's a little bit of a difference, you know, because. You know, the missus, like anybody who's hosting, a, you know, you go to a restaurant with a group and maybe there's a host who sits at the end of the table who does the ordering or something. You know, you know, you, why did you choose the restaurant? You know, because you have confidence that it's going to deliver the experience for you. So there was that part of the job and kind of understanding that a little bit with very high expectations. But the other thing, food wise for me, you know, my internships are dotted around the country or, you know, and invariably in the in the itinerary, the sailing itinerary. I'd be close to one of the places where I'd done an internship. So I had some idea about the food, you know, what to expect. And I could start just letting the market drive my menu planning, let mother nature tell me <laughs> what, what should be on the table. And that changed the whole way I think about things. And, you know, the small galley and the, and the tight schedule, you know, you have to pare it down and tone down and really focus on the quality of the ingredient because there's a lot of flavor there. And if I just adorn something, you know, with this drizzles and shakes and grates or whatever and cook it the right way. I mean, that's all it really needs to be. It doesn't matter that there's a billionaire on board that you're serving because they're after the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that was a big change in how I, that's what I went to Europe originally to try to find. Right. Talking about what does it mean to cook and, you know, the chef thing, you know, that, that you can kind of school yourself along and 
but it's the food bit, you know, like, what is it, you know, and I just glom on to the Mediterranean and, and thought that that was a very humane way to look at things, you know? Yeah. Let's touch on that because brand 50 is not only about encouraging entrepreneurship, but to do that, I believe, we believe that you have to be healthy, nutrition, exercise, of course. No so question. Explain the Mediterranean diet and why it's so important. Not only the diet, I think it's like diet slash lifestyle. Well, right, right yeah, exactly. I mean, what I like to do is I like different ways you look at it. I kind of pull the word diet out of the way and say Mediterranean lifestyle and diet as an eating part fits into that. But, you know, I mean, it, it just sort of falls into the standard, you know, diet and exercise, diet and exercise. Now, what does that mean? It means if you walk instead of drive, you know, or you do something active, if you work your brain or do something, that's why the gardening thing is really important because you're kind of doing stuff, you're outside, you know, vitamin D, you know, nature's vitamins and the, the, the food is pure and you, and it stays that way and it's simple. And so, you know, when you make a dish, the ingredient list is five or six things that you all identify, that you identify with, right? And each one is its own pure thing. You'd hope that the food label, you know, on the back label of products had five or six things in it that you understood what everything is in it. And you'd say, that's awesome. Yeah. You know? But that's not how it goes, right? There's so many things in there to keep it on the shelf for a year and, and color it or preserve a color or something that then the list gets really long with stuff that your body really doesn't need. I mean, it's just very it's simple biology, really. But I think what is also alluring for me in the Mediterranean style of eating is that lifestyle and that attitude and that way that there's this casual exuberance that they, and they live for flavor, you know, I mean, it's so awesome. Mm -hmm. And when I live in Italy and you get on a bus or a train or something and you eavesdrop on people, they're talking about what they're eating or what they're going to eat or what they have. You know? yeah. I mean, they're just like program like that. Okay. I'm at work. I'm doing my thing, but you know, my mind is on dinner or this weekend or, you know, something like that. And I just like, that's amazing. You know, they're not like following a script, you know, of how to eat. And it's very communal, of course. Yeah, totally. And very opinionated. Right. Mm -hmm. As you probably know. <laughs> yeah, coming from a Basque heritage. Yeah. I mean, we know about sitting at the table for four hours, you know. <laughs> right, exactly. But, you know, there can be arguments over what's one way of doing something versus another. You know, nothing's wrong or right. It's just, you know, perspective or opinion. That's all good. But I mean, to, to live for that, as opposed to, you know, a lot of the stresses we sort of get blanketed over with in this society, it's like, oh my gosh, you know? So you do that for five years, you decided to come back to San Francisco. Right. Why? Yes. Well, I thought I'd pick it up where I left off. I was in the hot restaurant scene, having fun. Okay. And when you came well, back, what year was that when you came back? Uh, 1993. Oh, 93. Okay. Yeah. So a little then, while ago, but no, that was a lot going on, right? Yeah. So at, at that time, 93 up till 2008, you're cooking at different restaurants, right? You're the yeah. chef. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right. more, yeah, more to 93 to 2000. You know, I didn't pick it up where I left. A lot of things, things change. America changes on a dime. You know, you go away for five years and a lot. Listen, I mean, I didn't know what voicemail was until when I got back here. I was freaked out that there wasn't a person on the phone. Oh, my gosh. You know, yeah. stuff like that, right? Yeah. But I changed. And and so kind of picking up where I left off was totally like a little bit of Rip Van Winkle, for sure. Yeah, so which brings me to the interesting part of 2008 financial crisis. You decided yeah. to get a branding coach. Right. Now, oh, one thing, I don't know if I mentioned this in the intro, that you also produced 250 cooking shows. With you were, Jacques Pepin. Well, others, yeah. I'm sorry, you were what? Yeah, with Jacques Pepin, Jose Andres, Pepin, others, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. On Food Network's uh, Iron Chef Iron America. America. And so in 2008, you got a branding coach. And this is where your culinary arts and the light and set design work that you've done came together explain why you got a branding coach and, and how that works with the you kind of have like three businesses in one though right yeah i mean well what happened was you know i, I and without gay i i pulled out of the the of the re running restaurant and doing that and that's a whole other wall that i hit and i could just say as a chef and i there was a block between you as the person in the dining room and the story i'm trying to tell 
that I want to share. There's too many layers in between that on both sides, right? You come in with an expectation and I have, there's, there's just, it was like, wait a minute, I finally figured out how to cook and what it means, you know, and now I, I want to share that. And so I was like, you know, there's got to be something else. And without getting into the details of that change, I ended up back in show business, you know, being a culinary producer for cooking shows. So this television studio thing was right, like brought that back right to me. You know, I get it. And that was easy for me. And it's a tough job being a culinary producer for a cooking series. <laughs> There's a lot going on. Um, so that was all good. At, at the same time that the financial crisis came up, you know, chefs were now become, becoming brands. And I wanted to know what, okay, now, I, now I've got, okay, I know how to cook. I'm figuring out how to share like faster through television to you in your living room than it is in the dining room. Okay, that's all good. But now I have to be a brand. It's like, when's this going to stop, you know? Mm -hmm. But when the, when the crisis hit, you know, I knew it was coming, that it was going to be tough. You know, uh, generally a food television show is through a marketing budget and those budgets are all slashed when the market tanks. So I was like, all right, now we're going to have to revisit this all over again. Do I need to change my career? And I thought about that for a while. It's like, what am I going to do? I, I, I've got all these years invested in following something. I'd like to spin that somehow into an asset, whatever that is, and then start to move forward with it. That's not a, what a career coach does, really. But I now that this brand word was in the chef's world, I wanted someone who could help teach me what that really means and what it is to become or be a brand. Mm -hmm. And so I hired, found a brand coach through a referral and she was amazing. You know, it was a three day sort of immersion thing where the first day was all about extracting and trying to get to core values and learning about where that is the nucleus of all other parts. And I guess what she teaches or what she does is one way of how to brand or understand a brand. And it's the concentric circles and all this other stuff. Um, and it was amazing. And that was 2008, you know, 2009, we did that work and it was not inexpensive, but I think it was a very good investment for myself so that I even still, when I look at the arc, the brand architecture that we made, I, I feel the same way. So clearly she got out of me in, our, in the core values, what needed to be there. It's actually beautiful. So you have Volo Chef. Right, Volo Chef, which is um, sort of B2B mostly, 80% yeah. B2B, let's say. But I just want to tell yeah. people there's a lot of great there's a lot of great resource resources on there just for people interested in cuisine and you have recipes on there and everything. But well, then more on Mediterranean summer has a lot. That's where the yeah. content, yeah, yes. that's where yeah. So then Volo Chef is ties into Mediterranean summer. Right. Different website, but it's part of your whole brand. And that website, I recommend you can spend days on that website. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. Which one? Uh, Mediterranean Summer? Mediterranean Summer. Or, uh... Yeah. Well, they, they both are. But yeah, MediterraneanSummer.com is has recipes, has a bunch of resources on Mediterranean. Cuisine. And it's building. I mean, that's just the beginning. But yeah. it's beautifully done. It's a lot. And yet, you know, I'm trying to sort of show through the site design and the navigation of it and the content that the message here is about purity and simplicity, but there's so much information, you know, I, and I mean, I still have another punch list of things that we're going to load into there in the coming months. It's not just a blog of, of I, opinions. It, I want it to be a resource and use it to inspire others to contemplate for themselves the choice one may want to make for themselves under the sort of veil of wellness and mm -hmm. not being vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And, and, and then it's wrapped. I mean, there's no other diet that you can say, you know, has such beautiful backgrounds and connotes such beautiful things and music and taste and style and art and culture and history and tradition, places to go visit. I, you, I don't know any other diet where you can say, I want to go and buy bin wherever the keto is. Yeah. And I'm not knocking that, but where is keto, right? <laughs> where are they? Yeah. But when you say Mediterranean, you go, Oh my God, there's a seascape with yachts and clear water and beautiful salad yeah. you know, and a glass of rose. I yeah, got it. And all those years, uh, uh, the five years on the yacht. So, part of Mediterranean summer 
is not just a beautiful website and all its, all its resources, but it's actually a business. You take people on a tour. You have one coming up in 2022 in June, I believe. Right. Yes. Very Bush exclusive. Room. Only only 20, 24 people. Correct. Not even. I'm going to limit it to 20. I think uh, for various reasons, but that's a nice small you know group size. And you can find that information on the website. But once you, yeah, give, a little, once you give a, a little, uh, you know, just a little talk on what that cruise is. Well. I work with Oceana Cruises as an instructor at the, the, the culinary center that they have on board and the ships. There's only two ships in the world that have these, well, not four now, but with Oceana, just the two with this beautiful hands-on cooking school. And I've been doing that since almost 10 years now with them. And I do it a month, one or two months a year. And I stay exclusively in the Mediterranean, you know, cause it's right in my wheelhouse. It works out really well. I decided, I said, you know, I want to do my, I want to do a Mediterranean summer something. So we have the Mediterranean summer cruise for food lovers right now. And, you know, the ship as a venue has the culinary center. It's a beautiful vessel. There's a lot of nice amenities on board. And the itinerary that I chose is going to be in France, Italy, and Spain for 10 days. So as we're moving the narrative about the foodways and the evolution, I mean, I can just go on. I don't know if 10 days is going to be enough, but in 10 days, you know, we can touch on things and we can do And By the time we get to the end, you'll know the difference between a Spanish and Italian olive oil for sure. Right. And well, I want to live that a little bit. Plus the storytelling, because, you know, I wrote the story, you know, I wrote Mediterranean summer. Right. Great the book. book about my experience on the yacht. So I want to share a little of this narrative, you know, and bring everybody with me, not just in the cockpit, but in the galley. Right. And kind of set up when we get to next ports of call, things to look at or think about with food as the number one priority, let's say for the rest of the day uh, or something to consider because that's where the people are, right? When you go visit a place, go to the public markets and mm -hmm. see what's going on, how it feels that day. You, know, you might have some of the best experiences just sitting at one of those little restaurants near an open air market or a public market and getting some fouille de mer or some tapas or something like that. And just being part of the, you know, it's, you go back to the ship where it's so beautiful and perfect. You're like, whoa, where was I? You know, I was just immersed in, you know, wherever we were. So I want to share some of that and set it up so that that idea carries on when you get home. So just because you've left the ship and you left the Mediterranean physically, you didn't leave emotionally. Oh, that's, that, yeah, that's a great comment. Does that make sense? Oh, it totally makes sense. Because I totally live this, right? I mean, they, you know, the pusher's got to do, <laughs> I'm selling yeah, yeah. the drugs. I got to be the guy who, you know, practice what you preach, right? Exactly. Because I always say, you know, people say, oh, I'm so stressed out. I can't wait for my vacation, my two week vacation. I go, well, great. Anyone could be relaxed on a two week vacation. It's like, how do you bring a vacation mentality the rest of the 50 weeks you're working, right? Exactly. And, and, and sort of fold that into the other things that you do. So that lifestyle is, is now compartmentalizing this rat race thing that we've been so good at for so long, you know, if you eat a little better and exercise a little more and sort of sit down and actually eat your lunch and not wolf it down or eat over the sink or eat, put the thing in the cup holder in the car and eat while you're driving, yeah. you may put some years on your life on the bar, on the far end, you know? Well, speaking of putting years on your life, we're just kind of getting out of COVID. Now, obviously restaurant business, you were working on an ocean liner on a cruise ship. Obviously, all that just dropped off the planet. Oh, my God. That went right out the window. So what did you do this past? Well, that was a bummer because months. I had two really good contracts last year, too, and the perfect times of the year to be in the Mediterranean. You know, I was going to be there in May and September. It was gonna, I was like going to be the best year of all so far. And mm -hmm. then, <laughs> yeah, you know, but I used that time to look at MediterraneanSummer.com. And I hadn't launched the food section yet of the website. I did that by design when I did the site originally, because I want to make sure that the food section really had a strong foundation to what this idea Mediterranean is all about. So I wrote articles that are in there. They're under the perspective section of the site and, you know, worked on recipes and started to put that together and really think about where I want to go with Mediterranean summer and how I can try to, sell a cruise during a pandemic <laughs> worked out. We're almost sold out, which is beautiful, you know, but I wanted to kind of understand where I'm going to go with this and not just spew out content for the sake of content. You know I mean? I, I, I need to kind of make it work. I've got to 
have something to provide a good or a service on the other end of that, you know, and it's gotta be a business. I mean, it's trademarked, so it needs to be in commerce, you know? Yeah. So, so it was actually, even though you weren't technically working, it was a good time to really reestablish, you know, what yeah, you now I'm kicking myself. I should have worked harder. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And then, uh, and then, so all and then currently you're still working, uh, you working at a restaurant too. Are you not? Well, no, not with restaurants too much. I mean, I do a little product development or recipe development for the through through another uh, consultant for the big food companies and restaurant companies, but not for the most part. I'm really sort of focused on really building Mediterranean summer. It's mine. This is time to really do this, you know. And the other thing that happened, we were talking about it before during the closure last year was uh, I was like, okay. And it's funny because everybody had the same idea. I want to do some edible gardening. Mm -hmm. And I did a lot of stuff online. You know, I'm a, I like to learn and be thorough and took some classes and things like that. It fits right into the idea of the Mediterranean sort of lifestyle, because I know when I'm on a train and look going through Italy, just about every single backyard has edible garden, mm -hmm. everybody. And that's another way to kind of therapeutically, like right now with my plants, you know, they're like my kids. <laughs> you know, and we're, we're on, I'm on, the meter's on now, you know, and it's a thing. They're growing. I've got to take care of them and prune them and this and that and the other thing. But now it's in a cycle, you know, and there's been a whole cycle to that, that now you can see how the food cycle fall. What happens on the table is a result of what's happening in the growing. Especially now with, you know, talk of our immune system. I mean, yeah, you want to boost that as much as you can, yeah. you know. You but I tell you, and it's true, if I pick and serve and within hours, what I feel nutritionally because of that immediacy from something that just came out of the garden that I do very little to because of the Mediterranean style. I don't want to bury it under a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, the energy. Yeah, I mean, you just feel it, you know, it's like, wow, this is amazing. And it's so simple actually, when you think oh about it. Oh my God, it's really simple. Yeah. Well, that's great. I think, I think I touched on everything that I wanted to, anything you want to say that I didn't touch on? No, I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, how's it fits with brand 50 and on some of the sort of reinvention. I mean, you know, I, I guess it does, maybe in summary, when I look at it, I was just thinking about it this morning, you know, I was like, you know what, there's been some sort of, I don't know if they're milestone markers and walls that I hit or things where you need to do a reset and say, okay, what happened there and kind of look at them all over time. What was the reason for that one? Did I, did I, did I answer that one that led to the next one? Da, 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 and just say, is there anything lacking? I mean, what, what else, you know, not that I want to hit another wall, but what needs to be sort of kind of tweaked a little bit maybe to push forward. And I don't want to, you know, bog down too much on all that, but it's just good to know that, you know, and then I go back to my brand architecture and say, okay, is Mediterranean summer doing what I set out for it to do? And I'll just share with you, because we were talking about a little, when we did that brand architecture, you know, I put myself in the middle because the, the coach said, remember, you are the brand. Mm -hmm. All these things are external. So what comes from you is up to you to make sure that that carries into the way these things operate, right? If nourishing, and I'll just share as one of my, or nourish, not even, and nourish has a lot of meanings, not just by food, but by, right? If that's one of the core values, then as a TV producer or a producer of something in Volo Chef, am I nourishing my client? Am I nourishing the project? Am I nourishing brand, the brand itself, right? Okay, well, I also obviously nourish in Mediterranean summer. I mean, that's clear if you talk about food and lifestyle and diet. But am I also nourishing the per folks on the other side through an idea, you know, or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And the same thing is if I move into a good or, you know, a product or a service, right? And that's what we were talking about this cruise. I mean, it's not like, come along with me, we're going to eat and drink and have a great time. No, I have to make sure that I set out to do on that for the others what my architecture establishes me to want to provide. Right, right. That, well, that's, that's a lot. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, no. That that's great advice for people who are in that fifty plus. When, when I made my decision at fifty two, to you know just go out on my own, you do have to look at your past and the things that you did right and wrong, and then come up with something. So no, that that's great advice. Yeah, I mean it's important, you know. Or or you can just not, you know. What I mean, you can just oh, blow yeah. it all off and you know take it by carpe diem. And sometimes that works, you know. Most of the time it doesn't, but <laughs> yeah, most of the time it doesn't, but it's a good idea. <laughs> so how can what's the best way of people to reach you and check your stuff out? Well, I would say for now now Mediterranean, go to mediterraneansummer.com. That's mm -hmm. probably gonna be the best place. Okay. For now. 
And when that spins, you know, I'll there'll be Facebook and Instagram and all that other stuff. But this is this is HQ, you know, headquarters. Okay. And that's where most of the updates are going to be for anything, whether it's the cruise or another one or classes or a YouTube channel. Or whatever. It's all going to be in, in, in there. New recipes that come up, you know, things like that. That would be the best place. Okay, great. Yeah, I highly so, recommend it. links back to Voloshev. If you want to get to Voloshev, you just go to Mediterranean Summer and then you can get back. To okay. Stuff well. Yeah, I highly recommend people go on the site because it's, it's ab- absolutely beautiful. You can learn a lot and you'll definitely get some recipes that you'll want to cook. So no question. Yeah. So thank you, David. I really appreciate Pleasure. it. And no, it's good, all good. Yeah, good luck on the cruise. Take care. Thank you so much. You bet. Take care. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. For more information on all of our guests, go to brand50.com, where you'll find show notes and other resources to help guide you through the next exciting phase of your life. Please consider subscribing to our podcast on iTunes, along with other platforms, and write us a review while you're there. You can also sign up for our email list on our site to get the latest podcast updates. We promise you won't get a constant barrage of emails from us, and you can bet we'll protect your privacy as well. You can also follow us on social media accounts listed on our site. Thank you for listening.